uh, welcome you to our conversations on the Heritage Action Plan, sponsored by Heritage Vancouver, as well as SFU Woodward's the Van City Community Office for Community Engagement and the City of Vancouver. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, neighborhood character. This is part of our series. We have uh, we've had two already, and on June 12th, there'll be one on our main streets. Uh, on the 12th, our panelists are here: Martin Farbrag, Maria. Stanberg, uh, Charles Gauthier, myself, and Donald Luxton will be on that. Um, so I'm the president of Heritage uh, Vancouver, and we sponsored this to be in support of the uh, Heritage Action Plan that was uh, started by the city uh, last year, and uh, which Donald Luxton is organizing, and we'll be releasing some results soon, we hope. <laughs> so um, we welcome you here and hope that you um, can engage and maybe have some questions for us and help Don. This will be recorded and then it will be part of what we present to council and some of the information through uh, Don Luxton and Associates, which is doing that. Uh, I'd like to recognize that uh, we are on unceded territory, the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Slayo Truth Nation. Um, and that uh, we're going to now have Don Luxton speak uh, and frame the conversation, give us an overview of what we'll be talking about. And then Ian Waddell, our moderator, will come in and then we'll introduce our panelists. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Javier. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so this is all uh, happening within the context of the city's heritage action plan for which I'm the lead um, consultant of a team of consultants um, and we're about halfway through the process and when I get to my last slide I'll tell you about the next steps and some of the things that are being um, released um, very soon. So the heritage action plan is a set of actions that will update the city's heritage conservation program. I won't go into a lot of detail. I can always speak uh, if there are any questions, but uh, some of you have seen this before and know that there's a, there's a number of actions that are being undertaken as part of this very comprehensive process. In essence, this is our chance within our generation to really undertake a review of the Heritage Conservation Program, which dates back uh, to 1986, so the official adoption of the Vancouver Heritage Inventory. Uh, but certainly, and as Mike and I were talking earlier and the panelists, uh, the city's um, heritage initiatives go back to the 1970s. So it's a long-term process that's been underway, has a lot of successes, and um, also a lot of things that are changing over time. So we're looking at a number of things in a very comprehensive way. We will be updating and reviewing the Vancouver Heritage Register, which has been essentially and very much in its current form since 1986. Uh, we're going to uh, look at improved heritage conservation tools and incentives, streamline application processing. Uh, and of course, one of the key issues and the one that we're really uh, focusing on tonight is to take immediate action on priorities, i.e. character homes, and that includes, as we'll speak, for Shaughnessy. Um, and the city is also working on maximizing sustainability outcomes and involving and engaging the community. Very briefly, this goes back to May 2013 when Council requested uh, recommendations for improving the conservation program, uh, and the action plan was approved in December 2013. Uh, June 2014 is when the one-year temporary protection of First Shaughnessy was brought into play and also uh, the beginning of the interim checklist uh, required for pre-1940 homes, uh, so a character review. Uh, we started work in September 2014, the consultant team on the Heritage Action Plan. And of course, one of the things that sparked that action of, of moving forward with the conservation plan review was the fact that people were really feeling the change in the city of Vancouver and, and exemplified by lots of demolition. And the, of course, the statistic is that we have about a thousand demolitions a year in the city of Vancouver, which is three times what we would see in Toronto. So this is the kind of thing that has sparked interest in 
uh, the idea of neighborhood character as well as heritage. So there's kind of two streams going on in our thinking in the Heritage Action Plan, neighborhood character, character of individual buildings, as well as heritage in the background. So they're two kind of complementary things that we're looking at. A uh, couple of things just to point out, uh, the city of Vancouver is quite unique in Western Canada in that it, it's under its own individual charter. This allows the city to do many things that otherwise it would not be able to do. It, and it actually provides an enormous amount of discretionary flexibility for the city to do things in, for example, single family zones that other municipalities just cannot do. Um, I mentioned that the heritage conservation um, initiatives have been underway since the 1970s and formalized really in 1986. So in terms of key areas of, of work, uh, you can see I've highlighted there the character home zoning review is what we're focusing on tonight. The, um, just a quick overview because we realized when we were talking earlier we were throwing around like we do when we have these discussions, RT and RS and all those wonderful acronyms. So I just want to explain a couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, when we talk about the register, it was originally the Vancouver Heritage Inventory, adopted as a register in 1994, a comprehensive list of 2,200 uh, buildings, sites, red, um, landscape features, etc., cetera, um, that are considered to have heritage value. That's a very small fraction of the number, total number of buildings and sites in the city. The uh, city has incentive programs that it uses to help uh, assist private owners retain heritage buildings. We have three um, heritage historic areas, Gastown, Chinatown, and First Shaughnessy, which uh, is under review right now in terms of its administrative framework. Um, and also zoning protection for other character areas, notably Yale Town, which is an HA or heritage area zoning, historic area. But there are a number of what we call RT zones. So we, you'll hear that tonight, the RT zone. That's a retention zone. Um, and those are put in place to conserve neighborhood heritage, uh, neighborhood character. So that uh, there's about 10 of those RT zones, including Mount Pleasant, Kitsilino, Strathcona, et cetera. And in those neighborhoods, there is um, an outright allowable density. Uh, if you don't follow guidelines, don't keep a hair, uh, character building, et cetera. Um, or you can receive bonus density for keeping uh, an existing building and following guidelines. And in addition, you can gain some additional density if you uh, undertake a heritage project in those areas. So those have been quite successful in terms of actually conserving neighborhood character and building stock. So when we say an RT zone, that's a retention zone, an RS zone, is a single family zone, and you'll hear that term tonight. So as part of that um, Heritage Action Plan, the city uh, introduced the Character Home Zoning Review. This is an interim measure, and it's one of those things that is part of the review that we're undertaking as we're moving forward. Um, which is, includes a checklist or for determining character in pre-1940 homes. So the city now will look at a, in certain zones of the city, uh, look at pre-1940 homes and say, ah, yeah, you meet certain criteria, we consider this to be character, and there are, mm, th there are some incentives if you keep and some consideration if you don't. So that's, that's the way the city is now filtering out or trying to slow down the demolition of, of uh, pre-1940 character buildings. Part of the discussion we've been having in the engagement process and the open houses we've been having with people is that's a really, that's it's something that the city can control because they, uh, through their zoning, they control land use and policy and building form. But that then presupposes the question that keeps coming back up, is that what neighborhood character is, is keeping pre-1940 homes? And that's part of the discussion we've been having with people and what discussion we're continuing tonight. And I'll just summarize to say that in our discussions to date, or as I say, we're about halfway through this project and we've had a number of open houses and especially around for Shaughnessy, uh, people have reacted to that question in many different ways and it really depends which neighborhood you're in and what you consider to be neighborhood character. To summarize what we've heard to date, and I hope we can build on this in our discussion tonight, but many people recognize that the, the, 
there were things in your na their neighborhood that represented a time period. Um, but not everybody was kind of hung up on the pre-1940 date. Uh, and some felt that there were mm, buildings built after that that had a lot of merit that were really important. Um, heritage and character meant different things to different people. And, and one of the things that people came back and said over and over again was, uh, architecture, it's got to be great architecture. Um, but people didn't agree on what that meant. Some people, that was the old buildings, uh, unqualified support for pre-1940. And some people said, no, we can build great new modern buildings. And there's new modern buildings in my neighborhood that are really terrific. So we didn't have any kind of consensus on that. Um, however, people talked about heritage and character really being uh, linked to neighborhood identity. So it became more than the buildings, which I found very interesting uh, to talk to people about, especially because so many neighborhoods are different from each other. So what is that character? But people saw it as a collection of things. They saw it as the streetscape. They, they saw trees, and they saw gardens, and they saw lovely sidewalks, and not a lot of paving, and lovely houses, and small, all the things that you know are under threat in some neighborhoods. Um, but it was the totality of what they were looking at that was important. And finally, different people had different cultural experiences in terms of what they thought was important. And some really saw the neighborhood in a much different way than their neighbors did. So these are all things that I think are starting points for talking about character. Just finally, where we are going next, uh, this is our uh, best. No, uh, <laughs> we think this will be the dates. They're pretty nailed in now. June 2nd, the council report on First Shaughnessy uh, will be released. And, and as part of that, we'll be reporting back to council on, um, at a high level on the entire Heritage Action Plan, including the character issue. There's no specific recommendations yet on the RS zones, um, but certainly there is for First Shaughnessy. So watch for that when that council report comes out, because that that's uh, pretty interesting um, direction that we're going in Shaughnessy. And Shaughnessy, of course, is very different than the other neighborhoods. Uh, on June 9th, council consideration of that first Shaughnessy report, and if they mm, start uh, the process ticking on reading the bylaws, then we'll have a process that um, develops from there. Late summer, we're looking at further recommendations on what we call the RS, or sing single family residential zones, not RS1, which is our biggest single family, but RS3, RS3A, and RS5. And by the end of the year, we're looking to complete the Heritage Action Plan and wrap up our final recommendations, including the update of the Heritage Register. So tonight, um, your discussion will help us uh, think about those issues. Uh, we value your input and your comments, and we look forward to your questions as well. Thank you. Hey, we're going to work. Can you hear me? Okay, we're inviting our panel to come up. And uh, there you go. You can help yourself. Uh, the format we're going to have tonight is, the format we're going to have tonight is, I'll introduce the panel briefly. Uh, and then um, I'm, I've got a series of questions, six questions that were given to me. And I think I'll put them to a, a panelist and uh, get him or her to answer. And the other panelists can come in. We'll spread it around so that we don't have formal presentations and so on. And uh, then we'll have some time to um, have questions from you people. So let me just uh, introduce the panelists here. On my far left <laughs> is uh, Caroline Adderson. Caroline is an author of four novels. Uh, two collections of short stories, as well as books for young readers. She's received a number of uh, uh, nominations, for example, the Giller nomination, I understand, for, for books. And she's win, won a couple of um, prizes, the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prizes and others. She's the creator of the, of the Facebook page Vancouver Vanishes, which currently has, in my notes, it said 5,775 members, and she corrected it. 
<laughs> to 5,994 members. She obviously takes it pretty seriously. Uh, and uh, a book based on the page will be published in the fall of 2015 with Anvil Press. Caroline. Okay. Now, I, ha I have to be a good boy here because uh, when I was in the House of Commons, there was a debate on capital punishment, and I said I was against it with one exception. Bad architects. <laughs> oh, and I've paid for that ever since. But we have a good architect here tonight. Uh, his name is Ian McDonald, and he's, uh, he's a registered architect and partner with uh, Bruce Carcass, uh, Karskadden, architect. Uh, uh, the firm's work includes significant heritage uh, projects, including 33 and 55 Water Street, the Burns Block uh, micro lofts, and a recent on-fill project, 564 Beatty Street. He's taught at UBC uh, School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. He's a board member of Vancouver Centre Gallery and committee member with the Vancouver Urbanarium. Um, Ian McDonald. I might add he's got a, a good, good first name too. Uh, uh, and I, sitting next to me is a fellow I, I've only known for 30 or 40 years, and I, 50. There's a big, there's a big uh, uh, thing for me to introduce you, Mike, but I know you as Ho Chi Harcourt. The, <laughs> the, he used to call himself when we were young, the grave. He called me in law school. Oh, yeah. Sure. You went to law school? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, he was the head of the, the storefront lawyers here, and that's how I met him, ski cabin storefront lawyers, and he, uh, he and the group of people really preserved what we've got today right here and uh, in Strathcona, Chinatown, Yaletown by stopping the freeway and forming, um, um, working with communities. And then he decided to get into politics. Jeez, he was terribly unsuccessful. Ran for councillor, got elected. <laughs> Ran for mayor and got elected. Ran for MLA and got elected and then became Premier of British Columbia and was a good Premier. Uh, he's a very practical guy. I could tell stories, Mike, but I will He's a very practical guy and he's very dedicated to the community and a courageous guy after his fall coming back and uh, has a wealth of knowledge about heritage and the city of Vancouver. Mike Harker. Now, here, now here's the up and coming now, this is the guy who I think should run for city council. I keep pressing him to do it, but someday we'll force him to do it. Uh, Am, I don't have a biog for you. Can you tell us what you're doing now? Uh, before you do, let me say, Am Joel here is, is, is filling in for Wendy Peterson. Uh, she had a family emergency, and she gave her regrets, and I'm sorry she's not here, but Am's filling in. So what are you doing these days, Am? <laughs> I agreed to do this at 9.05 this morning. But I work as a Director of Community Engagement here at SFU's uh, Woodward's Building. Uh, I sit on the Vancouver City uh, uh, Planning Commission. I see a couple of my colleagues here, Robert Matus and Elizabeth Ballantyne, the staff person with the commission is here. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Van City Community uh, Foundation as well, which is part of what they uh, work on and, and do granting on is social purpose uh, real estate. Okay. Um, these these mics are a bit hard to, to work, so we got to keep close to them. So, if if we're not if you're not hearing at the back, put up your hand, will you? And so we're better. I'm going to start this way. I've given, been given six questions. Our first question is: What features give areas their distinctive character? How can neighborhood character be defined? The issue of neighborhood character. Uh, uh, Don uh, Watson uh, talked about that. So I'm going to uh, go to you, Ian, and see if you could respond to that question. How would you define neighborhood character? Well, I think you're right, actually. I think Don did a very nice job right at the beginning, so I don't really have a lot to add, uh, except that I think there's often two ways that people will attack the problem or think about it, and one is to uh, focus on what's commonly called um, form and character, by which I think people typically mean a roof, it, if we're thinking about houses in particular, uh, roofs with eaves and a particular kind of detailed expression about how a uh, column on a porch might meet its uh, overhang, um, the orientation and depth of, say, a a siding, a wood siding, say, and whether or not it's beveled and things like that. And I think that those are 
small pieces that are really important to people because they are the, the little details that communicate a kind of neighborhood sense, whatever that might be for them. But I, for me, it really resides in the, the kind of massing of several buildings in a row and the rhythm that that creates. And in particular, um, if we were to think about neighborhoods that aren't just residential, um, the the kind of enduring use of that area and um, and also a, a kind of culture of use that might exist among the residents. So, you know, I'm from Toronto, so I think about the change over change over change that's happened in the annex and in, um, in Little Italy for those people who are familiar with that. Okay. And do any of our panelists have any commentary on that? You want to say anything? Don, you, you raised it. Do you want to redefine it again? No. Okay, I think, yeah, closer. Um, one of the things that strikes me in Vancouver is how many of our buildings are the first building built on the site. And that's extremely unusual in an urban setting. We're a very young city. Um, we were talking beforehand, Mike was from Marple, and <laughs> he can describe some of what that area was like when he was growing up. I grew up in South Vancouver when there were still lots of cows. You know, so the, when we look at the buildings in Vancouver, Often they were built, the first building, and they're built, many of them were built at a time when we were designing for the car. And so the southern reaches of the city tend to be way different than the much earlier parts of the city that were built, laid out on, for streetcars and horses. So there's been a very rapid evolution of the city, but we kind of sprawled out, and now what we're doing is kind of washing back in a way um, and densifying in a way that other cities were built more dense. And Toronto, for example, doesn't, I think one of the reasons they really don't have the number of demolitions is they went dense a long time ago. Anybody else? Well, let, let me move on a little bit here because one of the things about um, a neighborhood is the, the, the houses in it and especially the uh, uh, character homes. And the, the next question is, how can character homes be defined? To what extent is neighborhood character defined by things other than houses and buildings? Well, Carolyn, would you like to comment on that first? Yes, thank you. Um, so I, it's obvious that I'm kind of the outsider here, <laughs> um, but not only due to my gender, but um, I'm actually the only person who has nothing to do with planning or, our bus or the um, architecture or even heritage, actually. I'm a fiction writer. So that's my preoccupation that I've brought to this question. Um, so when I first started thinking about what is character, I responded in the same way that most people do in thinking that it was something visual, that aesthetics had something to do with it, which obviously it does, and that's what most people respond to. Um, but th I think there's a lot more than that, and that's just really the surface of it. Um, we respond to the outside way something looks because of what's inside. So my preoccupation is with narrative. And I see um, a character house as being a repository of narrative. And so that functions in two ways. Um, the first has to do with the materials that are used in the creation of the home. So most of these pre-1940s homes are made with almost entirely natural materials. And you see this when they're demolished. What you see is this great heap of wood, like real wood. And so uh, within that is what I would call the embedded narrative. Um, anything that comes from nature already has a story. So once upon a time, a seed fell in the forest and a tree grew. And then 100 years later, <laughs> someone cut it down. And right again, we have another layer of narrative because uh, the way we logged back then was by hand. So you have this very deep interpersonal relationship between the construction of something, the people who had to do with the building of it, um, the way the wood was milled, and then how it's built by hand. So these homes are what I would call organic and artisanal, and we're attracted to them in the same way we're attracted to the tomatoes in the farmer's market. We pay extra, not just because they taste better, but because we we understand the story behind it. So that's what's in these houses. 
Um, and the next level of narrative in a character home, what we call a character home, or what I call a character home, is what I would say is the absorbed narrative, and that's the story of all the people who ever lived in the house. So uh, the house becomes, as more and more people live in it, to stand for the people who lived in it, like a, a living museum of human habitation, as David Owen wrote in his wonderful book, The Walls Around Us. And uh, obviously, this takes time for this to happen. You don't move in and suddenly there's a story of the people in the house. It takes a while. So um, my theory is it's a couple of generations at least, uh, so 50 to 60 years. And actually, the only reason I picked this figure is um, because recently we've had this kind of great swelling of love and fondness for the Vancouver Special, which used to be a, a mocked mm -hmm. architectural form. But now that period of time has gone by and now people are beginning to respond to the incredible stories in those homes because of who came, and they, most of them were uh, new Canadians coming and, and, and settling here. So uh, 50 to 60 years, then the house has its uh, embedded story and its absorbed story. So then I think there's a big problem here where we're going to remove all these houses um, and replace them with homes that are really actually only built to last 30 to 50 years, where at exactly the point that they would get their begin to accumulate their narrative, they'll be demolished and we'll end up with this as a city without any character, really. I, I'm, I'm, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking of the big issue, it seems, you see in the papers here, density. Like, mm -hmm. if you're gonna increase density and affordability, they say, uh, doesn't that uh, mean that um, we are got to get do something with those character single family houses? Uh, well, you could retain them, and um, I mean, we, ha we have more density before they're removed because, on the west side anyway, they're removed uh, a 2,500 square foot house with often with a already a, a, a secondary suite in the basement, which is quite affordable, um, is torn down and instead you have a 5,000 square foot house uh, with a three car garage and nobody living in it. So we have less density, not green, no stories. Um, it's actually against every, everything we purport to stand for in the city. Anybody else got a comment on that? Well, I, w I would um, abolish single-family zoning anywhere in the Lower Mainland. Uh, that doesn't mean you're abolishing character homes, uh, because what you could do is you use those character homes better. In other words, they could be duplexes. Uh, and then you could get rid of those useless garages, a lot of them falling down, and, and put in, as we're doing now, lane cottages. <clears throat> so you'd have a triplex. So I, I think it's, it's really a question of creativity and innovation and, uh, and, and realizing that uh, young people cannot afford to live, by and large, in this city. However, they're not going to own a single-family home. That, that day finished 30 years ago. So uh, I, I think that there's, there's ways we can increase density, use the existing building form better, um, and frankly, some of the ethnic communities have been doing this for decades. The, the Indo-Canadian community don't build single-family homes, they build boarding homes. <laughs> and the same with a number of the other ethnic communities. They're way ahead of us wasps, you know. We, we got caught up in the, want to own our acre of land in a single-family house. <clears throat> and, so, and, the, and the duplex that the uh, Italian and Portuguese and other communities uh, was really a, or the Vancouver Special was really a duplex in disguise, right? Um, so, I, I think we, we have a lot of opportunities in the existing 70% uh, of the city that's zoned single family. It, it's really a huge swath to be far more creative. Uh, so, I, I just want to add that, that density and character homes aren't an, uh, antagonists. But you'll have to put provisions in to maintain those homes or else they will go. They will go if you eliminate that zoning. Well, perhaps, 
Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Perhaps not. I mean, it's it might be a case, and I don't know what the answer is. Um, I'm going to leave that to Don to tell us in a few months, I guess. <laughs> um, it does seem that there would be. It's it's easy for me to imagine that there might be provisions or incentives that would encourage people to retain that, um, whatever those homes are. I would make the observation, and I like the way that you talked about it in terms of uh, personal stories and narratives. I think that's really interesting, and certainly that gets to the core of why anybody places value in living in a particular, not neighborhood, but community even, right? So it's, um, I was like the murmur project uh, for that. So there's a lot more of them in, Tor in Toronto again, but there's one in Vancouver that's kind of interesting. Um, the Vancouver special though, those weren't built to last. Um, as long as they have. The reason they've lasted is because people have, uh, be I guess, uh, strictly speaking, because it's been cheaper to keep them um, and because people have come to like them, I guess. So there's no reason why uh, a new house built today that's meant to last for 30 years wouldn't last for 50 or 60, depending on the quality of the construction, and in particular, its adaptability moving forward. Like I think one of the things that's missing from the conversation um, so far is like, what is the future heritage, right? Like, where are the buildings that you invest in now? Um, where uh, nobody really talks about that, and I'm not. It's not clear to me how we come to an agreement about what um, what that is. Like, uh -huh. is whether or not there's a set of metrics. Okay, I'm, we'll come. Might come back to this, but I'd like to move to the third question and maybe paraphrase it. I don't know how many have it. The question says this: What layers are important to an area's character, and how much of this should be captured? Is authenticity important. For example, having different income groups in the area, different stages of an area's development, original residents versus changing demographics and so on. Let me, let me ask Mike, I'll make it a, maybe a difficult question. Can you get different income groups in the same area? Can you retain that? Should you? Uh, how do you mix that up? And, uh, and what about different ethnic groups in the city? Well, the answer is yes if you have the political will. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, we introduced um, a fair share of nonprofit co op housing and of childcare facilities and of post release uh, halfway houses and seniors' facilities. And we just said that every community, whether it's Shaughnessy or the downtown east side, will get its fair share of uh, housing and a mix of people and a mix of family types. And and uh, we did it. And uh, uh, I remember going to a fierce meeting at uh, what used to be um, uh, PW High School, then became Shaughnessy Elementary, to build a Ronald McDonald House. Remember the, anybody here remember that? Yes, uh, it's right at I think Angus and and Twenty Fifth Avenue. And we had uh, the Denisons and Shaughnessy show up, and 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 about fifteen or twenty of them stood in front of Harry Rankin. George Peel, bad idea, uh, and made some really foolish statements about, you know, well, it's a lovely idea, but not, this is Shaughnessy. You know, I remember this one particularly odious guy who got up and, and did that very obnoxiously, and I nodded about a minute before he was going to finish to Harry and to George, and they beat the shit out of him. <laughs> you know, uh, these, these are really sick kids, and, and they need to be here close to the hospital. And who the hell do you think you are? And there's none of these in your half of west of, uh, of Granville. In, at the east of Granville, there's about 14 different uh, personal care and other facilities. And this guy was so thunderstruck that, that he staggered backwards. And as he was going backwards, he pointed to Harry Rankin. He says, I'll ever vote for you, Rankin. <laughs> and Harry looked at him and he said, if you ever voted for me, I'd quit politics. <laughs> hey, Mike, I, I, Mike, I, re I recall some city council meetings where Puel and, uh, and uh, Rankin weren't exactly your best friends. Oh, yeah, no, no, they were, they, 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 well, let they, me ask you they this. Like me too, but the point is, you can yeah. do it in existing neighborhoods, and you can plan it in new neighborhoods. And the council in the 70s, when we uh, took over all of the uh, southwest Falls Creek and developed that, that wonderful um, Norm Hodgson's vision of Granville Island, uh, that's now being copied all over the world. Uh, we uh, social engineered. We said a third will be low income, a third will be middle, and a third will be high. And we want to have a mix of people. We want to have a mix of, of single people, uh, of couples, of, of families, 
I want to have people with disabilities, so we engineered some of the units of the Creekview Co-op to be able to be the first place for people in wheelchairs to be able to go to. We did the same thing in Champlain Heights, where Don grew up. They used to be dairy farms, and, and uh, we got them in a tax sale in the 1930s of the city, and we did the same thing. We social engineered that that, that that mixture will take place. And I think we can do the same thing in the downtown east side with the new plan. There'll be predominantly low-income people, but there will be some middle-income and some richies. And there should be. It shouldn't be either Yale Town East or a ghetto. So uh, the answer is yes, I think you can build uh, neighborhoods that are diverse, yeah. both ethnically and uh, in, t in terms of income and in terms of uh, the household formation, the type of family they are. Uh, Mike, I was just thinking when you talked about the co-ops and all that, the difference in the period that you talked about, there was a lot of federal and provincial money then, and there isn't that money here. Maybe we'll come back to that a bit because, you know, a lot of it comes down to money. But I wonder if any of the uh, other panelists had a comment on that. I'm just going to jump in a little bit. I think the question of, of heritage, particularly in this city in BC, is particularly complicated. Uh, uh, by the fact that treaties were never signed here. So the question of what constitutes heritage in a place um, uh, where things are still under active land claims and, and these types of things rarely gets brought into the question and how we uncover that, that conversation. Um, I, I think also uh, there is this kind of tension between progress and tradition built into the question of heritage that needs to be kind of teased out uh, a little bit more. I spent a lot of time on Main Street in the 1990s, and it's a much less interesting place to me that now than it was then really? because really? of the mix of businesses and the affordability, all of those pieces that, that come in. And I, I think um, I, I'm lucky enough to live uh, in a 1930s uh, character home. It was a, um, uh, a, a craftsman house that was built. Uh, it's still affordable along uh, Fraser Street to be able to rent and, and live there. When those pieces start getting uh, uh, taken out, how do we build in the policies that protect the kind of tenure that people have in terms of time and commitment and other types of things that make neighborhoods interesting? Uh, my friend Matt Hearn, who lives over on Commercial Drive, he tells a very funny story. You know, he's lived in Commercial Drive since the early 90s, and he talks about you know raising his kids there, you know, working on so many. Uh, uh, committees and volunteering, starting the Commercial Drive Car Free Festival, you know, doing all these things that fun to funkify uh, commercial drive, but it's those very things that end up driving up the prices that change who can actually be there. He said instead of doing all these types of things, he should have been throwing garbage on his neighbor's lawns and <laughs> doing drive-by shootings, and it would have kept things uh, slightly affordable. He, of course, <laughs> says that jokingly, but I think that these things of, you know, people make a neighborhood, and how do we bring uh, that into the conversation? Just last night, we screened uh, a film by Julia Kwan, Everything Will Be, that's set in Chinatown, a national film board film. We had over 330 people uh, in the audience who were predominantly under the age of 40, and you could have handed them pitchforks uh, after that, because I think people are really passionate about this conversation, and the affordability question, when it gets infused in with heritage, makes it uh, very, very interesting. Okay. Ian, yeah, just, just to add to the uh, how do you layer uh, on neighborhoods, and, and can you engineer it, uh, what I find amazing about this city is very few people say they live in Vancouver. Right? They say they live in The Drive, or Carisdale, or Kitts. I mean, people really identify with the neighborhood that they live in. And, and one of the things that quietly and subtly, and nobody's really uh, picked up on this, um, the generations of councils have overlaid that sense of neighborhood by keeping the streetcar uh, commercial retail zoning, you know, the, the old streetcars used to be every six blocks and you could walk from the streetcar to your house easily, north, south, east, west. And the only elected parks board that I'm aware of in North America uh, from the beginning has made sure that there was parks. Now some of them were grassed over parking lots, they weren't terribly interesting, particularly in the east side of the city until the 70s when we changed that. We built branch libraries, we built uh, community centers, we had community schools, we had uh, seniors, uh, uh, five different seniors centers throughout the city. Uh, so it was that sense of community 
subtly built into the 22 neighborhoods that make up Vancouver, which I think is one of the charms of the city. Um, and, and people do it unconsciously. You know, they don't say they live in Vancouver. Like, how, where do you live? Or you live Hastings East, or you live on the Drive, or Champlain Heights. And I think that's a very telling positive sign about the, 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 how you can layer on that sense of community and character in a community. Okay, Mike, fine. We'll go. By the way, Am, did you really have to bring Surrey into the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let's, let, let me move on to the fourth question. Okay, how can we balance heritage conservation with community and financial interests? And then it says financial, social, environmental. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what this means. Do you, do you want to tackle it in and see how you would define exactly what that question and what well, well, I'm not really possible answer? Yeah, I'm not really sure either. I did have a follow-up question yeah, for Mike. Sure, go I'll, ahead. It, well, uh, m maybe we'll return to it a little bit later. Um, I actually think the question sort of misses the mark a bit. Because um, while I think uh, in my experience, when we've worked on heritage buildings, it's very clear that um, heritage and finance kind of work in lockstep, right? Um, developers are able to use the heritage uh, toolkit in order to leverage uh, added density and other bonuses and, and such. And I'm sure that this building is, is an example of that, although I don't know many of the details. I think the real question, though, is like how would you balance, because I think that's why we're all here, is how do you balance not heritage with finance, but the ambitions of heritage with um, the real reality of a rapidly densifying city um, and the kind of dynamic change that's um, at the front. So like how the real question is, how do you balance heritage with the future? And I don't know um, exactly what that is, except to um, have lots of panel discussions like this, and to be very, be very clear-eyed about what constitutes actual heritage, as opposed to um, a kind of nostalgia for buildings, all buildings of a particular era, or accidentally encouraging buildings to look like old buildings, but they never quite they never quite get there, right? It's like uh, buildings that are built now that look like old buildings, they're a little bit like computer-generated people uh, in movies. They're close, but when you look at them, they're not actually, they're, there's something ever so slightly wrong and you can't quite tell what it is. And I think that's really dangerous because it, it robs you, it robs people 30 years from now of the ability to understand where they came from or where, where we are right now. Right, so I think, I think to me that's the central and most interesting tension. I, I think this is where uh, Carolyn's yeah. contribution of narrative really yeah. Yeah, enriches totally, the discussion. Yeah, I was thinking that too. And so yeah. when one of the things is, uh, I mean, I live in that world where we're doing pro formas on heritage buildings and it's, uh, after a while it's like, okay, fine, 250 a square foot, blah, 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 blah. If you ask somebody if they're happy or not, they don't tell you 250 a square foot. You know, so it's hard to quantify the quality of life in economics. Um, so when we have this discussion, and I, I, I don't have the answer, but I think you can also say, take that heritage piece away and what's left, right? How much poorer are you if you don't have it? And so part of what that discussion, I think, is happening in the neighborhoods is that sense of loss is there and it's palpable. And so it's, is it being replaced by something that's better? And I think that's, I mean, the story I can tell is that why am I even involved in heritage to begin with? 1974, I was, you know, fine art student at UBC and the Burks Building was being torn down. And I was told by the newspapers and everybody in the media that well, it's too bad the old building has to go, but the new building will be so much better because it'll drive the economy. Into th we got the Scotia Tower. I, I think that's a net loss. So I, I have called it an act of corporate vandalism, actually, in print. Um, but I think that we also have to think about what value that story of the city adds to the rest of the life of the city. And I don't know that we can quantify that. I think you know it when it's gone. And that's important. I, I, I just want to say something about, I went to the Heritage Awards a couple of 
three, four weeks ago, and uh, there was a, the keynote speaker was a landscape architect, and she did such an amazing thing. She walked up Main Street, and she took photographs on both sides of the street, and one side had been redeveloped and was all new, and the other side was old. And she said, so this is 30 seconds later on the other side of the street. And on the old side, it was packed with people and life and, and uh, fruit uh, carts out front of the grocery store. On the other side, there was nobody. It was like, you, you wouldn't ever have guessed it was this actually two sides of the same street. So, you know, that's, that's what I think we lose when we lose all these old buildings, is this uh, interpenetration of the psyche. I mean, the, the, the house is the young symbol of the soul. And um, uh, I think we're, you know, very quickly losing a big piece of our soul. Yeah, but you know. But I don't think that that's tied ahead. necessarily to the age of the building. No, like well, that. no, I, and I don't think it's pre 1940 is the, right. you know, but a certain length of time. And I'm heartened to hear you say that you might be building uh, houses that are going to last longer than 30 years, because I sure see a lot that aren't, you know. And I and I see, you know, I cut a thing out of the Courier, uh, one of the architects involved with uh, Langara Gardens. Uh, he said that uh, all those low-rise apartments have to go because they're 50 to 60 years old. So I'm assuming if he considers 50 to 60 years old the lifespan of a building, then that's the kind of building he's putting up. And and so is it greener? Is it green to tear down all your buildings every 50 years? Right. You know, what? Panelists answers. What if a, what if some of these old buildings are falling down, or they're in bad repair, or suppose they're a school, and uh, you have to trade off? Uh, you know, um, do you preserve an old school if it's uh, not earthquake proof? I mean, um, it's not just houses and that. What what do you do with these houses that are perhaps falling down? They may look good. They may represent a neighborhood character or something. How do you keep them, or do you keep them? You hire Ian and me. <laughs> um, go ahead. Well, I was. I, schools are obviously a, a hot button issue, and I think the those are ones actually that I think we all get to have a say in. Whereas I'm uh, a little bit more precious about. Um, an individual's right to do what they want with their own home. And I think for schools, we have either through um, ambivalence or something else, all agreed that we're not really gonna do a lot about that. And I mean, we've already made that decision in many ways. And I think that the, the answer to your question really is, um, how much do you value the old school and do you want to pay to upgrade it? I, I think it's a very, very uh, interesting question because uh, in, in my neighborhood uh, uh, there was a Charles Dickens School and the heritage advocates, uh, people like Annabelle Vaughn and others, uh, did a, a very important fight around uh, heritage around it. But when it came to uh, speaking with parents of the elementary school, they wanted a new school. They wanted uh, the heritage question was the secondary one to the functionality uh, of the school. And those are complicated questions to get into in terms of, uh, of how to move forward when you have timelines and money being available um, uh, from, uh, from government in, in a limited time. I, I think that there or is a available. bigger kind of elephant in the room as well. Uh, here, which is I think we've done many, many things very well in Vancouver, which were applauded for in planning schools around the world, but in many other instances, we're uh, very adolescent. Uh, when you take a look at uh, the amount of money in civic politics here, the regulatory structures where we don't have limits to campaign funding, uh, even though uh, people do talk about neighborhood or identify neighborhood, like Mike says, uh, we had a chance to um, uh, speak with Darlene Marzori three or four months ago with uh, several other uh, planning commissioners. And one of the things she reflected on looking at the last civic election was that there was actually very little discussion about neighborhood. There was a lot of, when you're in the at-large system, you're mobilizing along, uh, could be class lines, could be ethnic lines, could be many things uh, beyond the neighborhood in terms of what the at-large system, uh, the reality of getting out the vote. And so uh, until we have uh, structures where we have neighborhood neighborhood representation, uh, whether it's the ward system or others, or until we get uh, big money uh, out of politics, we get a sense of regulatory capture in our policies uh, that drive, that give uh, capital an extra uh, a seat at the table uh, than to bring the kind of policies we need to uh, to talk about heritage and actually make those policies land down as a fact on the ground. You know, I'd like to tackle that falling down question, Ian, because yeah. I hear it all the time. 
a building is usually falling down when someone wants to tear it down. Um, and I would, um, uh, I would use the example of St. Paul's Hospital that a month ago was perfectly fine and going to be fixed up, and all of a sudden a month ago it's going to fall down, so we have to move. Um, it, the, the, it's, the funding is complicated, and I wouldn't want to minimize that on something like schools. You know, we're going to save some, we're going to lose some, we only have so much money. Uh, but the, the answer is, do we value something enough to save it or not? And that's the constant battle, the constant struggle that advocates for heritage go through is they see the value of something, but they don't necessarily have the money to put on the table. So they have to convince other people of the value of that site, the value of, of the, up to the community. And often that's a big struggle. But if we hadn't done that, we would have lost the Orpheum, we would have lost, who knows, you name it. You put those buildings on the table, we're richer because we did save them. So there is a role, and I think there's a very clear role, for saving our quote unquote heritage because it enriches our community. The question of character is the one that's really challenging because it's that gray area in between. What we can all kind of agree is the most important church, the most important school, and then maybe we can find the money to save it and use the heritage tools to save it. If we used the tools to save every building, we wouldn't have tools left. So I guess back to Ian's comment, yeah, we know, we know the rules for heritage now. We got a pretty good set of rules for heritage. We're getting down to the, the, the those are the easier ones in a way. The tougher ones now are the individual homes, the, pe the, the neighborhoods, and that's where we're finding that conflict is happening, and that's where we're trying to find a way to value those pieces of the puzzle. And, and so within the neighborhood, and again, back to the discussions we've been having with different communities and people, they also really value the trees. You know, that's something else that the, the city is just starting to grapple with is, you know, the fact that most of the trees in the city were planted at one time. They're all die, gonna die at one time. I mean, there's, there's a lifespan to that urban forest. Um, they value gardens, they value open space, they value views, they val there's all kinds of things they value, some of which are gonna be compromised by development. So those are the kind of things that, when we start to layer it in, it becomes very much more complicated than just, is this a pre-1940 building? which is part of the puzzle, right? So don't have the answer, but people kept coming back that we talked to, to how they felt in their neighborhood, and I agree with Mike. I mean, people really identify with where, the, where they live. So are there opportunities to shop there? Do they know their neighbor? Do they feel comfortable on the street? You know, and I agree, maybe you should throw garbage around and keep it cheap, but you know, we, people don't do that. They have pride in their neighborhood. Well, that leads into, I want to go to the audience soon here, so that leads, in, leads into our la the last question. And it's kind of technical, I think. What current approaches, tools, should be continued? Zoning, incentives, what could uh, be some new approaches, some tools to explore? What does the future hold? And how do we um, meet some of uh, Don's um, requirements, if you like, or what people want, uh, with kind of tools to do it? I don't know, Mike, have you got uh, I know you said what you used in the past. Um, have you any, any views on that or any of the rest of you? Well, I think the city has, as, as Don has pointed out, an incredible flexibility that having your own charter gives you. And we were able, because of that, to set up the Property Endowment Fund, for example, that when we started at uh, Art Phillips and Fritz Bowers and I in the 1970s, we put 100 uh, revenue-generating properties the city got through tax sales and other means into that, including the development in, in False Creek and Champlain Heights. It was worth $300 million in 1975-6. It's now worth $3 billion. And, and the revenue from that is invested back to keep the, it growing or into strategic um, development purposes. So you, there's, a, there's a source of funding there. There's a whole series uh, that Ian and Don could tell you about of incentives, disincentives, bonusing, uh, that, that, that the city has, and I don't want to bore people with a description of all those. So I think there are a lot of tools. Um, <clears throat> my problem is that it, it, we adopted in the 1930s Harlan Bartholomew's plan for the city, which was based on his plan for Los Angeles. And the plan for Los Angeles was based on freeways and suburbs and nine to five downtowns. 
And that has been the disaster in North America for 70 years, that, that kind of a plan. Instead of, uh, as we, we, we started to turn around the 1970s when we threw the plan out that Bartholomew brought in and we said, no, we want to have a downtown that's uh, re-energized, that people live, work, play. And we, you couldn't build housing in downtown Vancouver from 1932 to 1975. The zoning didn't permit it. So that's, that's how horrific bad zoning can be. And the only way, when we tore out the streetcars and we tore out the inner urbans, <coughs> that my grandmother, when she lived in Gillies Avenue out in Burnaby, uh, had three different inner urbans she could take into her shop in the old Hotel Vancouver. We tore all those out, and the only way you could get anywhere was on freeways and in cars to Surrey or, you know, some of the uh, Richmond or wherever else. So uh, I, I think we had a, th that, that was a very bad negative uh, period in the city. It's the reason we got elected in 72 to stop that after we stopped the freeway. Can you imagine an elevated freeway along the waterfront of Vancouver? That was the plan of the city council. Do you think of any dumber? Uh, than the Alaska Way freeway on our waterfront, you know. So we, we've made some good decisions. The other thing that people have to realize is even though the Coast Salish people have been here for 10,000 years, and I'm, and I'm glad you recognize that fact on unceded territory, when I grew up as a kid in Marple, it was forest. When I went to David Lloyd George and then to Wilfrid Laurier, and, uh, it was forest from 57 uh, to... 33rd, Oak to Granville. When I was a boy cub at, at uh, Marple Community Center, that's where we go camping in the summer. <laughs> so, and that, that, that whole south side of Vancouver, heritage, yeah, it was heritage farms and, and, and forest, uh, a huge whack of that, you know, including in the in Southlands and, and, and the uh, uh, Mackenzie Heights and through a lot of Carousel. And so you, you got to realize that, that we don't have um, a lot of heritage. And we put up 3,000, was it 3,000 buildings in the 70s and 80s that we put into the heritage registry? I mean, we just blew our brains out uh, doing that and using cash to back it. So I think, Ian, I think we have, the, uh, we, we have the tools there, we have the resources there, and I think it's a tough issue now because we've, we've got all those old important marine buildings, et cetera, done. And the real issue is, is the single family neighborhoods and, and the character homes and what's character and what's authenticity and those are tough. But before I go to the audience, can I put a kind of a throw question to you, Carolyn? I don't know if you can answer. But do you think people in Vancouver really care about heritage? And, and, oh, absolutely. And you do? I do, I do. Yeah, I think they really, we, you know, they flock to these areas where there are masses of older homes and that's uh, that's where tourists want to go be, you know we don't go to Europe to look at all their new builds we you were just naturally drawn to to places where the stories are and um, I think everybody responds to that probably everybody in the audience here does well let's it's here for let, that reason let's that's a good segue from the <laughs> audience let's go to the audience so um, um, why don't you stand up and put a question? You could put it to any member of the panel. Um, I've got a mic here. I'll pass it. On. Oh, there's there's Javier, the boss no. here. We'll do it. Yeah. And and uh, put it to any member, and I'm the other gonna, members can come in. I want to just ask one question, and I'm going to just because I get to ask it, just because I have the mic. So <laughs> I think that this was something kind of interesting, and everybody's talking about the past and their loss and heritage, and I think it's kind of looking backwards. And if I take Caroline, I take your idea that. You know, we and, and Ian hinted at this, you know, what are the stories we're going to be telling each other in 30 years? If all the stories that we're telling now are the stories that we told 30 years ago, there's a problem. And what I see is that we actually look and we say, oh, this is a story that we're being told today. When you give the example of Chinatown, you go, that's the story I'm being told today. I don't like that story, right? So therefore, I'm looking back and saying, well, I'm going to look in heritage for that new story. I'm looking. I was kind of wondering that, well, how was the question formulated to say like, no, we want to know what that future is going to be and how it's going to look better. How did people fight these freeways? They said, that's a future we don't want. And so we're going to look back and do something else that's going to be new. At the same time, the discussion is here is what are we going to take with us when we go forward now? And that's the part of the character that's really interesting for me. Is so not just looking backwards, but asking you guys like, yeah, what would you take forward? Because, okay, you take some of your houses, you take some of those stories, but in 30 years, we need new stories. 
We need the stories of now. We need the stories of, are they stories of sustainability? What are the stories that we take forward? Uh, I'll, I'll throw in one comment, which is I think we build a lot of buildings. We don't build many good ones. And um, I, the next time I see somebody nail a fake craftsman bracket on a new building, I think I'm going to refer him to Ian for capital punishment. <laughs> um, so I think the worst thing we can do is try and drag the past with us in our new buildings. And so we, we try not to do that. Um, but a lot of that goes on. And it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon that people will buy into the idea of we can invent a heritage by just mimicking our old buildings. Um, I don't believe in that and I think we have to also design good modern new buildings. And I think one of the true strengths of what we're doing in the register upgrade is where, if you think of the change that's happened in the city in 29 years since the inventory was completed, at the time we were looking mo almost exclusively at buildings built pre-1918 and didn't recognize our post-war history. That changed and we are doing that. So I think that's a, that's a huge step in the right direction to really say there's great old architecture and there's great new architecture and there will continue to be great new architecture. Okay, let's go to the audience here. You got a question? I've got a comment on this a whole comment. business of what is the neighborhood character. My name is Bruce McDowell, I'm a Vancouver historian, and that's kind of important to this discussion because if you want to understand neighborhoods, and if you want to understand neighborhood characters, you have to understand the history of the neighborhoods. And I've only come to realize that recently. I was born over by the Ridge Theater on the west side, and in those days, in the 50s, you know, it was all single family dwellings. I, I, I don't think it ever even occurred to anybody that they'd ever want a suite in their house. It's probably the last thing they'd ever want. But I have lived over on Commercial Drive for the last 28 years, and I've come to understand why that is a popular neighborhood. And it's not obvious. It took me a long time to figure it out. You know, Commercial Drive is, is very popular for a lot of people. I used to drive up from White Rock all the time to go shopping there. I, I can't even remember why I did. But, but you, know, you know why, really? You know, it was so attractive to go shopping on Commercial Drive? It's because the city planned to widen the four lanes north of First Avenue to six lanes. So they made all the buildings after 1910 be built seven feet back. Now, while the city's waiting to build that freeway, meanwhile, Santa Barbara Market had seven feet of space to put all the vegetables on display, and Havana Restaurant had seven feet of space to create the biggest outdoor seating area on the whole east side of Vancouver. And now when you walk up Commercial Drive, you have all, the, all this cafe seating and people outside in the sunshine having a good time. All these vegetables that you can't ignore, bright colored vegetables, it's all very attractive. And that all happened accidentally. But that, that's one of the features that made it clearly a, a, an interesting street. Because back in the, in the 70s and 80s, no other part of Vancouver had that. They're, they're adopting it now. Now, the other thing that, that I've just figured out is that the people, you know, Commercial Drive has interesting people. Now, how did that come about? Um, I, I'm amazed to hear uh, uh, Don Luxton mention that RT zoning, you know, where I live just east of Commercial Drive is zoned RT4. Um, and and our, RT4 is, you can look it up, it's duplex zoning to promote families, designed families. Well, you know what makes Commercial Drive an interesting place is all those 1910 houses east of Commercial Drive, a lot of them have got three, four, five suites. And a, a lot of those houses look like they're two, two stories tall, but you know, some of them, you know, they've got attics and basements. So a lot of them have got living on four, four stories. And on my block, you know, I own a house that's got six legal suites that was done in the 60s. A lot of them are done in the 30s, I guess. And that's how people survived bad times, was they were able to rent out part of their house. But when you rent out, like I got a house that's four suites on four floors, 1910. And a bachelor suite in the attic, a one bedroom upstairs, a two bedroom on the main bunk floor, and a three bedroom in the basement with a garden. With a garden. That's called diversity. That's called a whole range of prices, a whole range of people that get to live there. The zoning is for half duplexes, which are now being built for about a million dollars each. So the whole direction of the neighborhood, people said they wanted to preserve the neighborhood because we've been going through the planning process for the last four years in my neighborhood. I've been to like a thousand meetings. That when we said we want to keep the neighborhood the way it is, the city kept the zoning at RT4, which is 
half duplex is a million dollars each is, is a direction it's going in. The old rooming houses are being torn down. If a house burns down, you can build two million dollar half duplexes. So, you know, it, it, if you don't understand where the diversity and the character of the neighborhood comes from, it's an old Edwardian village was built around 1910. It's got the character in the buildings, but it's also got the character in the people. The, every business I go to, I know the owner. He's behind the counter every day, all the coffee shops and restaurants. This is all part of, of old buildings. And, and the neat thing about allowing people to have, in the 50s at least they did, multiple conversion houses where you, where, you, where you could have four or five suites, is that you have this whole range of suites. And when you buy, you can afford to buy one of those houses because you can rent out three or four suites, live on the main floor. When you get married you can, and have a kid, you can take over two floors and blah, blah, blah. You have this resilience that allows you to stay in the neighborhood over time and, and, and just do a whole variety of things with a whole variety of people. If we leave it RT4 zoning, it's gonna be nothing okay, but okay, couples in half duplex is worth a million dollars. You have we, to understand that if you want to retain neighborhood character. Okay, thank you. Can we get a, maybe a, Don, did you have a comment for that or? We've, it's a fair How comment. can I disagree? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought it was Joe's Cafe that made commercial drive. <laughs> so I hope that's part of your recommendations. Yeah. If you want a diversity of people and you want to have affordable uh, units for tenants, which is a huge problem in this city, you know, the old three-story walk-up apartments are going very rapidly. And as Ian said, there is no federal nonprofit co-op program. Uh, Paul Martin got rid of that in 1994, one of the worst public policy decisions ever in this country. It costs us 25,000 units of nonprofit co-op housing a year. Over 20 years, that's 500,000 units of affordable housing that hasn't been built. That's a million and a half Canadians. That's a disgrace. Uh, and there's no capital cost allowance to uh, help accelerate uh, write-offs to build rental housing, and there's not a broad enough variety of provincial rent supplements to deal with the cost of renting. And if we want to have a diverse city and we want to have uh, low-income people or, or even professionals are moving out of this town now because they can't afford to live here. So I, I think we really need to be bold and gutsy and may, make, uh, how, how can we have character of old houses and neighborhoods uh, stay, you know, evolve and all that, but also make this city affordable for people that can't afford a million dollar duplex. But, but Mike, um, I, I wanna, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. I just wanna ask the panel if it's going if you put more regulation and more requirements it's in terms of heritage time, doesn't that increase the prices, make it less affordable? Can you get around that, Don or, or Ian? Yeah, I hired Don to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the duplex that we I, built. No, yeah. no I'd like that, to hear. I'd it, like, it was, that, that was a tough battle with the, that was, that the was boneheads we had to deal with at yeah. City Hall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going back into Mike. politics, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can say those kinds of things because I don't have to worry about voters and elections anymore. Yeah. Uh, one, what, one, what about I have that, one, Don? One, one comment. Yeah. Um, the, to, Paraphrase uh, sustainability, the most affordable building is the building that's already built, you know, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, what we, what Bruce was talking about really is adaptability of buildings and making them flexible and finding ways to do that. The problem is that depending on how you're doing that, you run up against all kinds of zoning requirements, building code, upgrading becomes very onerous, right? So there are, can be additional costs to maintaining existing buildings, and that is, that is something we have to think about. What we're up against in many ways is that it's to satisfy those requirements and also market demand, it is sometimes easier to tear down and rebuild. There is no question. Um, can you change that? Can you adjust the zoning to make that different? And I think we see that in you know, Mount Pleasant, Kitsilino, et cetera, where the RT, RT7, RT8 seem to be perking along pretty nicely. The problem there is that in order to achieve those three, four suites of str that can be stratified and sold, um, it's the, co the same cost as a heritage project. You gotta strip it down, you gotta put in all the new services, you gotta rebuild everything, you gotta seismically upgrade, you gotta put in sprinklers. So you can't get away with spit and polish. You can't do it, it's a rebuild. So that's the reality of a lot of construction. So 
The question is, is are we going to preserve everything? No. Um, is the, are, are the buildings we build adaptable enough? I don't know if they are. Um, and that's a struggle. That's a true struggle. Well, let's let let we have some room for some further comments or questions. Yeah. That was very good. Last, uh, uh, let's hi, I actually have the mic. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this is a little. Oh, off you got that mic. <laughs> this is a little off yeah. topic, but some of the comments that you guys were making earlier made me think of the problem of gentrification in Vancouver, and I wanted wondered whether you guys saw any connections between gentrification of neighborhoods, you know, working class families actually being pushed out by higher income homes, and just apartment rents going really high. Do you see that intersecting with the problem of character homes or just character at all in these neighborhoods? You guys have been talking a lot about like character homes, but earlier you were talking about like neighborhood character itself and maybe you see how gentrification is actually kind of eliminating the character of these neighborhoods and it's like actually pushing people who are the characters in these homes totally out of their places. Okay, Thanks. any response? I can, I can well, jump yeah, in go ahead. on, on go this one. Sam and then Ian. Okay. Uh, begin. I mean, we're in the Woodward's complex, which was a, is was and is a very polarizing project in the city, uh, in terms of how to do uh, heritage restoration. For some people, this is the model mixed-use development where you have 500 uh, condominiums, social housing, a university, arts and culture facilities, and for uh, a, a lot of other people, it's the beachhead of gentrification. So it drives up prices and uh, kicks people out of the, the, the neighborhood. Uh, uh, Wendy, who was gonna be on the panel today, one of the things she would advocate, what can the city do today in the context of federal and provincial government money not going into affordable housing? And what relates to heritage uh, is that the city unilaterally could be looking to buy SRO hotels uh, in this neighborhood. The province uh, leading up to the Olympics bought about 20 of those hotels. They've gone out and purchased some of those. It was in their plan, but it, they could certainly still be out there uh, buying three or four hotels a year, looking to renovate them, put them under nonprofit management. So we actually have, uh, although th these aren't ideal forms of affordable housing, they're the housing of last resort for many people. And when they are being renovated and changed and the prices are going up, um, uh, it, it, it directly increases uh, homelessness. But specific to this project, the SROs that were closest to Woodward's did go up in value and people did get evicted. And so that's a very real uh, conversation and I'm glad that you raised it. Um, well, I was wondering actually if it's related to um, a kind of building typology question. So I think about the, I guess it's the east side of Beatty Street, um, right where the Sun Tower is. Um, that whole block was renovated, I guess, in the late 90s or so. It was all warehouses previously. And it was definitely wealthy urbanites moving into that neighborhood. And you could say that gentrification totally changed the heritage character of that block completely by changing the use wholesale. Or you could say that it preserved it by further entrenching and enshrining that street wall very likely until the big one comes, right? Um, and knocks them all down in spite of us. The, so I don't, I don't know what the answer to the question that is, but I think that would be an interesting counterexample uh, maybe for you to consider. Okay, we had some people here. Some Hi, Pat yeah. McSherry. I live in the downtown east side. I'm very fortunate to live in a very well-maintained um, housing unit that is run by a church, and I pay one-third of my income for my rent. Mike, I'd like to know more about the endowment you were talking about. We don't have the money that we had in the 70s to redevelop Granville Island and the south uh, shore of Falls Creek. But $3 billion, can you tell us, could that money be used to build affordable housing in Vancouver? It is being used. And, and uh, the $3 billion is the asset value, the book value. It's probably worth 6 to $7 billion if you if you were to sell it off uh, on, on the market. Uh, so the city has had a very aggressive uh, housing approach uh, since the 1970s when we were building 1,000 to 2,000 units a year in the city of nonprofit co-op housing. A lot of it in and around the downtown east side in Strathcona and, and, and Granby Woodlands, all over the city actually, because we had a fair share of affordable housing policy for each neighborhood. So you're, you're fortunate you're in one of those um, about 8,000 units in the downtown east side that w was done under that program. Uh, and, I, and I think it's just a terrible tragedy that that program uh, federally was dumped. Uh, and I hope it's a major part of the October 17th, October 19th election. The question of affordable housing, childcare, 
uh, decent transit, affordable transit, uh, how we deal with the homeless and mentally Ill illness and uh, Aboriginal, urban Aboriginal people. Those are really important issues for cities right across Canada. So push that in to, uh, at the candidates when uh, they come knocking on your door and you go to a public meeting. It can be done, it's just political priorities and political values and political will. Okay. So you're saying that money is there to be used if they have the political will to use the it? The city is using probably uh, $30, $40 million a year on affordable uh, housing if there are federal provincial programs to do that. Matter of fact, we just did that with um, the city and the province and a group I belong to called Street to Home, where we raised $30 million of private money. We took 20 of that and we leveraged uh, 12 city-owned sites that they donated for a dollar worth about 70, 80 million dollars. That leveraged about 180 million dollars of provincial uh, dough from Rich Coleman uh, to build uh, housing for the homeless, run by really good outfits like the MPA, like Coast Mental Health, uh, and, and a number of others. So we, we have built um, probably uh, 2,200 uh, people have been housed in the last five years using that kind of leverage. So it can be done, it is being done, it's just that the city can't afford to do it all by itself. If it doesn't have construction money and mortgage money and rent supplements and other instruments that only a national or a provincial government can do, uh, they're really suffering. And the problem is the city council is the one that gets beat up on because people can go to city hall. Yeah. It's harder to take the ferry because you can't afford it now to go to Victoria uh, or to go to Ottawa. So, you know, they're, they're the most active, uh, but the most vulnerable because people are really and rightly so, upset about the lack of affordable housing. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, yeah, add, add to that, uh, you know, uh, as Mike said, from the early 70s to the early 90s, we had one of the best social housing programs in the world. We've had Michael Shopcott come in here and speak, Maloon Katari, the former UN Special Repertoire in Housing. So all of the institutional memory is there in terms of, uh, of levels of government. The federal government provided X amount of money. The provinces would often match. The city would provide the land. So all of that method and process uh, we know how to do it. It's a matter of the political will to put that back on the table. Uh, I think one of the frustrations around this is post 2000, the provincial government was still building social housing at the time. And eventually when that was cut here as well, the debate in the nonprofit sector was, well, if we uh, push for um, uh, uh, taxation incentives, we're letting government off the hook. And so, uh, in fact, we, we need government to put money on the table, but we also need all the other incentives. It's all of the above when you're dealing with the affordability situation we have in Vancouver where the prices don't meet uh, people's incomes. I think we got time for a couple more questions. Javier, you tell me when we don't have any time, okay? Um, somebody over there? Yes. Oh, I recognize that. Uh, <laughs> member of the uh, Board of Education or the... Um, yeah, hi, um, my name is Penny Noble and I'm here wearing several hats this evening, but the first hat I'm going to talk about is just that of an ordinary citizen living in Kitsilano in a hundred year old house with my, the street being decimated all around me li literally daily at the moment. And uh, Don, you mentioned that that zoning's clicking along quite nicely. Actually, it's not clicking along quite nicely at all in my neighborhood at 15th and Stevens, um, which is the RS8, I think. Isn't that right? RT8. RT8, I never know these names. Anyway, all I know is I've been told that's a problematic zoning um, because there's a lot of small little bungalows uh, that you can understand why people tear down because currently they're allowed to fill the lot from back to front to side to side, which they're doing with faux heritage always, without exception is what they are. Um, so I'm really hoping through this process that something can happen with that zoning before it's too late. Um, in my particular neighborhood, it, it, it is pretty heartbreaking to, to see this going on on virtually a daily basis. But beyond just the buildings, and some of this has been discussed tonight, is like, what is character? And character isn't just about the building. And you know, this is what we're hearing over and over again. And the Vancouver Foundation did a study a few years ago identifying that the, one of the biggest issues in Vancouver is isolation. People feel isolated. When you have different streetscapes and different kinds of buildings, just like Caroline was saying, with the one side of the street where people were out there on Main Street and the other, there was nobody. Um, it's, it's uh, I mean, to me, the character is people and it's connectiveness and it's a livable city and that's what it's all about. So um, I'm really hoping through this process that, the, that this is gonna fall on the ears of city council. I, I wish, 
at least one of them was here tonight or for any of these discussions, I have let them know about them. Um, because I think that's just so important that it's a way bigger picture. It touches on everything. It's not just what a building or a house looks like. It, it's what it does to our livability. It's what it does to our neighborhoods. It's what it does to our character. And that sort of segues me into my other hat, which is I am a, I am a school trustee with the Vancouver School Board, a, newly, a new trustee. And I did run in that election uh, Initially, I was considering city uh, council to, to get rid of those boneheads you were talking about, uh, Mike, uh, in terms of the heritage, uh, the approach to heritage and zoning and so forth. Anyway, I am, find myself on the school board. Happened to come in just, uh, Ian, as you were talking, and I think you said something about the schools and the heritage schools, that that's up to the public will, and I wish that were true. I have just today been in a meeting with some heritage groups that I facilitated with the facilities people at the school board, and the, um, it re well, and partially it's true in that the only way that any heritage schools will be kept is if there is the will of the community in those neighborhoods to actually lobby the government, the provincial government, or raise money privately, because currently the way it works is um, the only thing that the, the government has the money for or will pay for is to make schools safe. And all the parents, and rightfully care about, is making sure their kids are, are safe. So that's all the money goes towards. There is no money for uh, retaining a school that's, that's characterful or heritage or has any kind of designation. So it's a huge challenge, and the only way that the will of the public has anything to do with it is if they actually are going to have to take it upon themselves to do it. So I'm throwing that out there as some information that maybe as part of this process, schools can be identified because in some neighborhoods, they truly are the heart of the neighborhood and they help make up that character um, and, and livability of our neighborhood. So sorry, this kind of sounded like yeah, a speech. I, I can just uh, add something to that because uh, my son went to Carisdale School and we were very lucky to have on the pack at that time, Andre Roland, who's an architect and she spearheaded the campaign to save the school. So now it, you know, it is an anchor in that community. It's that, and I, I'm there every day with my dog, and it's, it's what, what defines Carisdale is Carisdale School. And um, I took the woman who came to live in my house in uh, 1926 and went to Carisdale School, and my neighbor Pearl, who was 94 at the time, and went to Carisdale School, and we went to the 100-year anniversary, and all the generations and all the people coming through the school to celebrate its hundred years um, you know it's it, it just an incredible thing to have that and the other thing is the school will last 200 years if they had torn it down and replaced it in 60 years we need another school so this economic model is so short-sighted um, it's just not true that it's cheaper it's cheaper now but it's not cheaper in the long term any other comments from the audience here yeah yes hi <coughs> can you hear me Yep. Uh, my name is William Lim. Uh, I believe that our discussion is good, but I think there's an, that there's an elephant in the room that has been not, that not been touched on. The elephant in the room that I specifically refer to is the political economy of development. Who, who benefits from any kind of, of uh, 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 development, what is urbanization, and who suffers or who actually pay for it? I think. Anyone that who has read um, Adam Smith's uh, book, The Wealth of Nations, will recall that the little story that he told in his book is that about the, a man, kind of half drunk, uh, walked past an auction, was selling some very, very uh, violent land, and he, in his half drunkenness, hit a bit for it. And which is a piece of land which is a mile, you know, a, a quite a distance from the existing uh, city of Insantia at the time. He hang on to it. But then mm, a number of years passed, the city expanded, and his land became valuable, almost like Richmond <laughs> or, or Surrey. Or you talk about or Forest Land, um, Mr. Hardcore, you talk about over there. So it's because, of, because it becomes valuable for some interest, vested interest, to develop it. 
And that's notwithstanding what Ames talked about, his friend about talk about uh, in um, a commercial drive to throw garbage in the neighborhood. Take a look at downtown east side today or, 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 um, or Chinatown. You know, Bob Rennie will disagree with that. You know, <laughs> it could be very, very uh, 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 un un undesirable area, but he is going to make some money out of it. This particular economy is that the people that who benefit from it is, is supported by two social forces in our society. One is urbanization, as we know, at this point in time, is more than 85% of the population of the, of, of, of the country, of the nation, and counting, and is you know, drawn into living in those 20 or so large urban centers. So this is a need. People have to live. People have to look for work. So the opportunity forced the people to go into urban centers, and land will be expensive. What it is, a pitched holes, or whether it is large mansions. So in a sense, that in order to fight against this force, it's almost like a little Dutch boy trying to stuck that finger into the dike to stopping the tidal wave. Because average person, even without standing on the general top of, they don't have the power to stop that money. And the second one is the political structure in our society. Vision start out as being very well, but, but how many people still believe in that vision is still really if for the small people that you talk about? You know, uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, Mr. Robinson is not going to go to some little uh, kitchen coffee table and, and commercial drive or um, on his side because he is enjoying to rub his shoulders with uh, Mr. Rennie or some other developers. So if you talk about political will, yes, who, who are those politicians that exercise the political will? So I think those are the elephants in the room, and we have to address it. Right? I, I might say there's a lot of elephants in the herd when it comes to heritage <laughs> and development. Uh, any comment from the panel? I blame uh, the CPR. Right. If they hadn't built that ra railroad, the, yeah. the Coast Salish could still have it. <laughs> and are there any other? Uh, We're any just other? taking it to Port Sorry. Moody. Yeah, Sorry. right. Exactly. Over here, perhaps. <laughs> then it yes. wouldn't be affordable. <laughs> Thank Port you. Um, I'd like to address another elephant in the room, and that is um, the rigid approach we have to dealing with heritage. Uh, by that I mean that it's this rigid way of looking at heritage that it shouldn't be confused with a new addition or uh, an expansion. So um, this idea that you cannot adapt in a sensitive way has resulted in, I'd say, uh, mass slaughter of many of the older houses in Vancouver. Um, I think a lot of developers, uh, sm smaller developers perhaps, um, if they were required to hire an architect uh, for a sensitive addition, sympathetic with the existing, and not encumbered by the rigid rules of the architectural community about no confusion, obviously I'm being provocative to the two of you, um, then I think there'll be a more sustainable approach so how would this work? I think that the answer may be in the fact that uh, City Hall, and you can correct me on this, doesn't require um, professionals to design um, habitation less um, uh, than 6,000 square feet, 600 meters square meters. So I think actually if you actually took that down to say 2,000 square feet, 200 square meters, and required any uh, building greater than that to hire uh, architects and engineers to do a professional sympathetic job. We wouldn't have these buildings just torn down. And I, I think that uh, um, the rigid approach taken by the heritage community is partly causing the problem. Thank you.
I, I was going to just, if I might take a minute, and I'm going to ask the, uh, the experts here to, to uh, respond, because it's a good question. I'm on the board of uh, Heritage Vancouver, and, and I don't know a lot about Heritage, because I came from the federal government thing, you know, and we dealt with different issues in provincial government, perhaps different issues. One of the things I like about Heritage Vancouver is it's not stick in the mud, like Heritage, we're against any development. What I think it's strong is that, to, no, we are prepared to say to city council somebody, yeah, you should develop that within some heritage principles. I think that's what you were getting at, uh, unless I'm wrong on that. Do you want to, well, you hear what I'm saying? Yes, I am. Uh, it's not just heritage Vancouver. There's a planning commission. Yeah. And the planning commission, there is another requirement that for a professional planner to pass the And any comments on that? Uh, I, I, I got no problem with raising standards, but yeah. the, the, you're talking on one side about rigidity on one side raising standards, so I don't quite, I'm not quite sure I get the point. Yeah. But the, the, the rule of size of building and architects required is the provincial legislation, not city. Um, it comes down to, I will take your point, absolutely, about good design. Um, I think that you know there's a standard that goes on of construction in some parts of the city and in some developments that we all recognize is not what we would like to see. Have we agreed on what that is? Um, I'm not so sure. Yeah, well, and one, yeah, it was ever thus. I mean, I think there's probably a mistake in thinking that we, we will somehow in the next 10 or 15 years figure out a way so that every single building that ever gets built in the city for the next 30 years is always good. And the truth is there's like, you know, 15 or 20 percent of the stuff is terrible and 15 percent of the stuff is really good. And then there's stuff that's all average. And and 100 years from now, hopefully everybody, like our kids, are smart enough to keep the 15% at the one end of the tail and get rid of the other stuff. And you know that's a lot of what I think people who are interested in heritage uh, now and in the 70s were doing. They were identifying the marine building, the things in the tail, the really good stuff. But not everything is great. Um, I, I liked your question a lot because I think it goes back to something that Mike was talking about, um, suggesting that the Vancouver Charter, and uh, uh, um, Don alluded to this as well, offers this, affords the city the opportunity to be sort of nimble. And, and as a practicing architect, I often feel that the city is not as nimble as it might be when dealing with planning staff and all the rest. And um, I think that's in part an ingrained kind of large bureaucratic culture, as anybody who's tried to get on the phone with Rogers or Shaw can surely attest. Um, but there's also, there's a tremendous amount of rules, and there aren't rules that are set up to encourage um, small-scale pilot programs or um, to afford opportunities for smaller scale development to happen, um, and I don't think that I don't think that exists, and I think that would be really interesting to figure out a way for for those smaller things to happen. Although I would retreat to what I had said earlier, which is I would feel extremely uncomfortable dictating like an idea of style or, as you said, something sympathetic to somebody who is doing something on their own land. Because I don't know what sympathetic means, because it means something to me, and it's going to mean something different to my sister, and uh, we will argue about it till the, the end of time, and I would rather be, I would rather suffer her bad idea as long as I got to do mine, and we'll let, um, hopefully one of us is in the 15% idea, uh, tail. But Don, you showed some pictures when you started there, and that those two houses, and then they tore one down, mm -hmm. and that, wow, it looked terrible, what they put next to the two houses. How could that have been done differently? That's a, good, that's a taste and style issue. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's really interesting, because that slide, that picture was actually one of the images that somebody picked out of uh, hundreds of images at an open house and said, that's neighborhood character. The, the new and the old, the contrast. So They thought it was good. They thought it was good. Oh, yeah. So, so the issue there is I think that, you know, a city is never going to be one homogenous thing. 
you know, and all those wonderful 1912 crafts and buildings we love so much, they were dead typical in 1912. People got tired of them and built something else because they got sick of looking at them. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, change that happens over time. And I think one of the great things about a city is that it, we have to accommodate change. Um, and if we didn't accommodate new buildings, we'd live in a museum. So I, I think it's great that there is the, this discussion about what is character. And I hope it provokes a better response to design in the neighborhoods that is sensitive and contextual and sympathetic, but perhaps contemporary. What's wrong with that? I, I personally don't have a problem with that. OK. Any other questions? Yes, front row. I don't know. Oh, she's got the mic. <laughs> Sorry, Why I don't you we'll do your question and bring the mic up to the, this uh, will, woman here, sure. will you? Thank you. Okay, okay. go ahead. So, uh, kind of tying into the idea of character and in a broader sense, I guess, I see, I think um, Don uh, mentioned a cadence a few weeks ago and the idea that it's also the size of the, the lots and the allowing change happen in a, in a street or in an area. And for example, like I live on Main Street and I spend a lot of my weekends trawling up and down looking in the lovely shops, which makes it what it is, which makes it uh, ideal for gentrification because it's got things people want to see and do. And they you know, build lovely new buildings and, and a lovely park there at 17th. And there's nobody in the park because the buildings to the edge of the park have no activation. There's like a shoppers and there's a TD on a whole block and it's to the point where uh, the shoppers drug mart actually has their staff rooms on the street front, which kind of suggests that there's a problem there, that the city haven't used any tools to activate the space, which means that they haven't acknowledged the character of the area and its um, importance. So I guess what could um, a protection of the conservation of, of a character area, what tools could the city use to, um, you know, trade off with developers to actually activate spaces and, and maintain a, a character that we know. Uh, perhaps Ian or Don on that one. Uh, actually, could you just clarify the park? Are you referring to the triangle piece in front of the white building with the Yeah, it's the at spring? 17th. It's a beautiful park, okay. and it, the building's decent. It's just that the building itself doesn't you know, activate, and by way of having only two units for a whole block, that's never going to facilitate change and adaption, which is kind of what's great about Main Street and all the little stores. and you know, coffee shops and things like that. You know, you have a park, but there's obviously no planning into the future of the park or the activation of the park. So, so go back to the economics of development, one of those herd of elephants that's been running through the room tonight. Um, somebody tears down some old buildings of a certain size that have little storefronts and they're only so wide, 33 feet wide, and then all of a sudden you build a new development and you put in your commercial retail units at the ground floor and you want them larger because you want to rent to Shoppers Drug Mart because that's considered a good tenant. Wow, I landed a Shoppers Drug Mart. That's a good tenant for my new development, but it needs, you know, a hundred feet of frontage and it's one entry and all of a sudden you've changed the dynamics of that street and made it less pedestrian friendly. So every, and this is the interesting thing and when we talk about main streets on June 12th, commercial drive, what would happen if the chain stores started coming in? The first gap that shows up on commercial drive, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, the, the the retail guys will say, this is fantastic, right? And everybody on the street will say, the street is suffering because of that. So I think those are the kind of things, they're subtle, but you know, in heritage areas, we're starting to think, other heritage areas and other locations are starting to think about limits on uh, assembly of sites and limits on size of storefront. Uh, that you can have in a heritage area because you can kill a street pretty fast. And so those are just things I think, I, I don't like the idea of blame um, because some, you know, we're gonna need shoppers drug marts too and we're gonna need different types of retail and we're gonna need all kinds of different things throughout the city. Maybe there's better places to put some things. So I think we need to be sensitive more to that street front okay. pattern. Yeah. You know, I was thinking maybe the solution, Don, is to get more marijuana stores. We could sort of have grass and stores, you know? Oh, we like, got lots, Ian. <laughs> they're, they're proliferating. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a cheap shot. <laughs> they only need 33 feet. They're fine. <laughs> you, you know, the real, the real challenge is look at your assessment on your house and how much of his land 
and how much of it is building. And is there any, it's about, it's about 90, 10. And what does BC assessment do to value the character of the house on that? That's 10% of the value. So that's, that's the real challenge. And uh, I don't know how you fix that because, uh, you know, we just built an up-down duplex, uh, our, my, Becky and I and our son and daughter-in-law, and the value of the land was three quarters of the cost. So that's the real 800-pound gorilla in the dining room table, is the, is the land cost in the city of Vancouver. And, and that makes it really hard then to value that 10% where there's no valuation placed on character, there's no valuation placed on the narrative of that house, there's no, there's none of that in the BC assessment system. And you can build something bigger to pay, help pay your taxes. Yeah. Okay, now we've gone from elephants to gorillas. We'll, we'll <laughs> have zoo a, here. We got to, to, you had a question though. I will yell it out then and then we'll go back there. Well, that? Yeah. Okay. so uh, I am no expert, so all I've done really over the last few years that I've been doing this is try to connect up with people who are experts who can give me some ideas. Um, so one of the things we did was we had a petition last year and I hooked up with some people that had uh, more expertise and it, clearly the number one thing that will help the situation is zoning. Uh, is t to get some kind of RT zoning in, which means you can't tear the small house down and b build a, a bigger one. But I think there's other things that can happen. Certainly streamlining um, uh, retention and grandfathering and all the kinds of things that it, prioritizing, you know, someone comes in, I want to tear down this house and build a new one and the other person wants to retain it. I mean, if we're truly green, all those retention projects would you know, get priority and we'd make all the people, the mean people who want to tear down beautiful houses, wait. And, in, and what would happen if you had disincentives and, and uh, delays uh, for those kinds of projects is that people who, who actually are only looking for a building lot would look elsewhere because they wouldn't have those delays, right? Uh, and what I was, re uh, in 2012, I actually had a really interesting face-to-face -face meeting with one of the vision counselors who was full of ideas. I was so encouraged. And then when I went home, she emailed me and said that was just my personal opinion. Um, and she wasn't really prepared to bring that to council, which was very disappointing. But one of the things she mentioned just came up, it's in the career today, which is about the land transfer tax uh, to, you know, curb, um, uh, uh, for uh, speculation, so you can't flip. There's massive taxes on flipping. And the other thing would, that she mentioned that nobody talks about, but which already exists for rental housing, is a rate of change policy. So if you had a, you know, some kind of policy where you know, in a particular period of time per block or neighborhood or whatever, only so many of these older houses could go, then, you know, then again, they would go, uh, you know, I'm not saying no development and no new builds, but I'm saying we are fast losing uh, our original housing stock in a way that, it, you know, I can't think of anywhere else that this has happened except places where there are, for example, earthquakes or wars, you know, that what what's going on. And if you live in a neighborhood where which is afflicted, you'll you'll understand it does feel like you're you're in a war. And so anyway, there's all kinds of I think piling on uh, um, uh, things that just make it really difficult. For example, okay, if we're green, then you are not, if you're not going to tear that house down with all the fixtures in it. You know, you take all those cupboards out and you take all those appliances. I can't tell you the appliances I see smashed up every week. Uh, and you donate those to Habitat for Humanity. And you have to pay to have all the plants in that heritage garden, including, you know, the 60-year-old rhodos, safely removed. And we could put those on sale. The city could sell them. They're worth a fortune and it could fund um, um, it, it fund f f 
uh, affordability projects and you could just tax the bejesus out of people. You could have a heritage tax. You know, you pick those, this house, then you, you pay and that money, you know, is a tax uh, uh, relief for the person who is retaining. Victoria has tax relief for people, um, you know, they don't pay um, property taxes for 10 years if they retain a significant project. So, you know, there's all kinds of things, but you guys know more than me. This is just things oh. I've... Well, actually, actually yeah. can I interrupt very quickly? Because yeah. clearly you're an expert. <laughs> um, and I think, but, but, in, but simply looking at it in a different way. And this is a total aside, but I can't help but be a little bit offended by the way you framed your question. Oh, um, well, only because it, and I don't, think any, I don't think this is what you meant by it, but it's like a subtle um, carving away um, at the value of expertise, which I think is kind of what you're, where your question leads to. Anyway, that's no. it. Everyone has an agenda. That's not all right. Let's, okay, let's, I, let's. We got uh, no. I'm done. I'm gonna go uh, back there. There's a question. I actually, a just, comment. just a couple of comments, and um, it's kind of related to things that Carolyn has said. Um, I live in the Quebec Manor Housing Co-op, and that's a hundred-year-old building, and um, I'm, I'm one of the lucky people in what you know that have benefited from that program, and um, we are actually in better financial shape probably because we live in a 100-year-old building, um, better financial shape than a lot of the new co-ops that were built that had to take out second mortgages because they had leaky co-op issues and all kinds of issues. And yes, we've had to kind of do some upgrading, but um, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a fallacy to think that just because you live in an old building and you want to maintain it, that it's easier to kind of build something new, that, that whole kind of idea of balancing the finance and the heritage. Also, um, I just retired as a teacher with the VSB for a long time. I worked at Tecumseh Annex, um, which is up uh, around uh, uh, Kensington Community Center. That was probably a building that was built in the early 60s. Spoke to teacher at Elsie Roy, and uh, I don't know if it's because the new, the building codes, but I got to have a bigger classroom and way more light in my room. Um, so there's a lot of pluses to keeping old buildings. And then the main school that we were attached to, Tecumseh Main School, was earthquake proofed about 15 years ago. And, and it's one of those old heritage schools. So somehow the VSB managed to do it 15 years ago. So I just kind of sort of question and want to say I appreciate what you said that maybe in the short term, but in the long term, and we have definitely benefited from living in a 100-year-old building. Mm -hmm. Well, thank yeah, you for your comment. I, any comments here that you'd like to be in? Well, uh, yeah, if you yeah. wouldn't mind. Uh, I yeah. think those are great comments. Some, maybe somebody in the audience can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the, the capital outlay for the seismic upgrades is actually the province, not the VSB. Is that right? Yes. OK, so, so that's. That's the province 15 years ago. That might have been not Christy Clark. Um, and then the second issue is, and I, I don't know what the solution is for this exactly, but I think the newer schools are driven by a programming desire for more and more classrooms. I agree. The old buildings had a much more generous idea about space and light, and part of that was a function of available technology. And I think that's probably common in a lot of old building types, not just schools. Um, certainly worth keeping in terms of their uh, they're generous spaces, and they they seem more adaptable. And I remember a student of mine presenting to the VSB a really thoughtful scheme for renovating one of the uh, the buildings. I can't remember which one. Okay, Mike, just just to, yeah, just to go back to uh, <clears throat> the fortunate occupant of Quebec Manor. Um, it's an example of how you can combine in an innovative, creative way the preservation of old, valuable buildings with a nonprofit co-op housing program. And the city can use its property endowment fund to acquire sites right down the lease rate from single family to a uh, 50-year lease or whatever. <clears throat> and we did a lot of that uh, with a group I worked with in uh, the 70s and 80s, uh, Jacques Curry, who did uh, the inner city housing, did Melton Court, the Manhattan, you know, some wonderful old structures where we, we took three or four different programs and made it work for old buildings. 
So I think we need that same jump of uh, willpower politically and creativity and innovation to try and have that character uh, of, of not just the house, but of the whole neighborhood uh, preserved. So you're, you're a great example of how the city did do what we're talking about here uh, in, in the 70s and 80s and a bit into the 90s before they killed that program. Okay, I think, thank, thank you. I think we're gonna, I see people going home. I see yeah, I'd like to thank everybody. We only have this space till nine, so thank you very much. I really appreciate, and Heritage Vancouver really appreciates you being here. This is very important for all of the city. It'll shape the city going forward for the next 25 years, so we do this all over again. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists, Mike and Caroline and Am and Ian and Donald and Ian for moderating, and I think Penny, who's also part of Heritage Vancouver, has a few words in closing. Thank you very much, and I'm wearing a third hat. Um, I'm on the board of the Heritage Vancouver Society, and I'm the Revenue Generation Chair. Um, and I, I do want to say also thank you to all of you coming out on this incredibly beautiful night that everybody is here as a testament to how passionately everybody cares about this. Um, so we put on these events uh, and many other things, and the Heritage Vancouver Society, long before I got involved, is just a bunch of volunteers who have made a lot of good things happen in this city and want to uh, really keep going with that and are starting to see some real progress, but we cannot do it without help. And the help that we really, really need is for you, each and every one of you, if you're not a member, please become a member. It's only $30. Um, Bill is there at the back. He can, you can give him a check and give him cash before you go. You can sign up. You can go home and go to our website heritagevancouver.org and you can sign up and it's not just the the money that we get the thirty dollars that we need for some sort of sustainable income it is the power of numbers we need to be able to say that we have over a thousand members that care about this and right now we've got about two hundred so please please join heritage vancouver society Dot org. That's how you remember it. And then one other thing, we have a fundraising event coming up, which is our annual garden tour on June 27th and 28th. That's a fundraiser. You can get tickets online or at a variety of garden tours, and it's great because you get to kind of see in places you might never get to see in, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So that's my closing comments. Thank you for being here, and thanks for your support. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Good night.